to Calling on the Name of the Lord podcast, coming to you from historic Bent Hill, North Carolina, on behalf of the Archdale Church of Christ in Charlotte, North Carolina. We come to you each day, Tuesday through Friday at 10 a.m. in order to present the gospel. Our challenge here is to spread the good news of the answer to the question, what must I do to be saved? The most important question one will ever ask or have answered. And the answer is in the scripture, Acts chapter 2, verses 37 through 47. Always remember that. That's why we're, our hashtag is hashtag AX238 for you. Acts 238 is for you. It's for me. And it says this in answer to the question, what must I do to be saved? And it is repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, and the Bible says in verse 47 that those who did so that very day were added to the church by the Lord himself, and what is true then is true now, and so this is the message we proclaim here on Calling on the Name of the Lord podcast, and we get our name from Acts chapter 22 and verse 16, where baptism and calling on the name of the Lord are synonymous. They are the same. Calling on the name of the Lord is baptism. Baptism is calling on the name of the Lord. That's Bible, my friends. And that is why we call this podcast what we do. This is a virtual Bible correspondence course where we ask questions of the scriptures and then the scriptures answer those in real time. And today, we're going to answer questions from our last time together, uh, where we studied these passages, and that was on the 3rd. Now, yesterday, we had a special presentation on the text of the New Testament that are used for translation, the majority or the minority text, and we'll have more to say about that in just a moment. But uh, we're going to be answering uh the questions we ask on the 3rd of February regarding Acts chapter 17, verse 32, through Acts chapter 18, verse 4. And so uh, we'll review those here momentarily. Now, just a couple of things that I wanted to uh, mention. Uh, first of all, uh, you might think this is silly. Uh, I don't. Um, the scriptures said, Jesus specifically said, that men love darkness rather than life, than light. We live in a very dark time. Uh, several weeks ago, Nancy and I flew to Tacoma, Washington, to attend her mother's funeral. Kathy Turnbull passed at age 96. We were there for a week. And uh, something very, very disturbing and distressing to me personally uh, came out of the blue. I hadn't flown in several years, and it was always my experience that uh, when you flew, uh, people intuitively did two things. One, they put on the best clothing for flying that was powerful. Business uh, dress, I guess you might say. And uh, also, nearly everyone had the window shades up. So the sunlight could pour into the cabin. And people could see what was going on, look at the clouds and the weather conditions, whatever else, uh, the beauty of the, the sky. But this time was radically different. Nearly everyone. In fact, this was uh, a very large airplane. It was um, uh, 
some kind of an Airbus, I can't remember what, but it was a very large airplane. And it was completely full of people. There was no empty seats. And to my chagrin, every single shade in that cabin was pulled down with the exception of two. Why? Because people wanted to look at their smartphones and the window shades being up, letting light in, cast a glare on those screens. So all the window shades were shut in the middle of the day for a six hour flight from Charlotte to Seattle. That disturbed me. Uh, the other thing uh, that disturbed me is that uh, people were all wearing very, very, very shabby and more important than that, dark clothing. It even appeared to me that we were on a plane load of Antifa protesters. Very, very dark. Uniformly so. I I had on a pair of khakis and a, a sports shirt and a pullover sweater. And I was the most dressed up person on that airplane. Years past, you'd see people in suits and ties. Those days are gone, apparently. It's very, very depressing. So, why do I say all that? I say that because I'm determined to, as much as I can, to wear very bright clothing in this time of darkness. And so, here it is in the middle of winter, and I've got my, uh, one of my, um, go down to the beach shirts on. So uh, I'm determined to dress in bright clothing to let people know that there is light out there. And when I have opportunity to fly on an airplane, if I have a window seat, my shade's going to be up and I'm going to be wearing bright clothing. So uh, anyway, I hope you do too. I hope you don't fall into the trap of wearing dark and shabby clothing because it sends a message that's not good. And that is that the times are dark and there's no hope. But in Christ, there is light and there is hope. So dress accordingly, dress in bright clothing, wherever you can go. Uh, now, that was the first thing I wanted to say. The second thing I wanted to just uh, tie things up from yesterday regarding the majority text versus the minority text. And the, the biblical views that we espouse here uh, are not majority views. Majority of people who call themselves Christians, even in the churches of Christ, espouse this so-called minority text that has removed passages from the New Testament. Most specifically that we cited yesterday were the last... Uh, Verses, uh, verses 9 through 20 of Mark 16, Acts chapter 8, verse 37, and some verses out of John chapter 5. And so I, I just wanted to tie this up as to why I've come to conclusions that I have. It is my contention. Uh, this is an opinion of mine. Uh, I admit freely it is an opinion. That the, and that the people who promote the minority text accuse those who support the majority text, such as myself, the textus receptus, the received text, the majority text, have added portions of scripture. They claim that Mark chapter 16, Acts 8, and 1 John 5 were added later by non-inspired copyists. It's my contention. It's quite the opposite because people often accuse others of doing what they are doing. It's my contention, my belief, that the Gnostic Alexandrians 
manipulated the scriptures to suit themselves and deleted passages from the received text. The other thing I would like to say about this is that uh, in regards to these matters, uh, people often approach them from only one angle. And generally speaking, when people discuss these matters regarding the majority versus the minority text, uh, they come from uh, one angle only, sort of a theological angle, and do not consider other angles. I, as train as tra training, I was trained as a historian and a communicator. I'm a debater. Uh, I love to find out the facts of a matter and present them and look at things in a broader view if I can. And so when I look at this controversy between the majority and the minority text, I look at it not only from a theological standpoint, I look at it from a scientific standpoint, uh, a standpoint from physics, a standpoint from history, and is and of course uh, every other way I possibly can and I've come to the conclusion that because of the fact that the minority text is found only in one place with only five percent of the total uh, and is supported one of the things that when you are involved in a question look at the character of those promoting such uh, and when i think about the minority text who promoted it first of all the gnostics uh, second of all the roman catholics thirdly Westcott and Hort, who promoted it, and they're men of dubious character. And the people who promote the minority text today are typically Calvinists. Uh, the most vocal among them is John MacArthur. And so I have to question uh, the veracity of the contention of dubious character. That also comes into play in to my uh, decision. I believe that the majority text, the received text, the textus receptus, is in fact the entire word of God. And this particular text should be the basis of our Bible translation. Unfortunately, it is not for most. However, uh, as we did yesterday, I do want to once again highly recommend to you this version. You may never have heard of it, but this I believe to be the most accurate translation available today. Based upon the received text, the Textus Receptus, the majority text, and it is edited by members of the Churches of Christ, it has been ongoing for 30 years, 30 years. And it's what they call an open source translation. In other words, scholars are welcome to make suggestions for revisions, a more accurate translation. And the last update was done just in December, in December of 2020, just two months ago. Uh, and so it's continuously updated and it's available for free. You can download your own free copy on your smartphone or your computer. Just Google modern literal version and you can download a free interactive PDF right there for free. And if you want a hard copy like I have here, 
since it the publishers are a nonprofit, they're not out to make money, you can buy this New Testament modern literal version on Amazon for seven dollars. The Old Testament is available for only fourteen dollars. Now that's unheard of for a Bible. Uh, and so I encourage you strongly to get you a copy, if not a hard copy, most certainly uh, will download the PDF and reference it every time you study your Bible. Now the language as it's literal is very wooden. It's not suitable for uh, like reading out loud, uh, but to understand the meaning of passages, it is the best, the very best that there is. And I encourage you highly to uh, take a look at it. And uh, don't always accept the obvious because those who have promoted the minority text since the 19th century are basing their opinions on Gnostics, ruffians, and Calvinists. So uh, think twice when you hear people say that, well, the uh, Textus Receptus has added passages. It does not. It's quite the opposite. A minority text has deleted. Okay, so uh, enough of that. If uh, you have further questions about these matters, put them in the comment section. Uh, let us know you're here. Uh, good morning, uh, uh, Mary, and good morning, Rosanna. I'm glad you're here uh, to hear our discussion this morning. So we want to go back to the passage that we uh, talked of last time, Acts chapter 17, 32 through chapter 18, verse 4. I'm going to read those again, and then we're going to answer the questions we had. And then we'll proceed to today's lesson which will be Acts 18, 5 through Acts 18, verse 11. So here we go. 17, verse 32, beginning. Now, when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, that's the Athenians gathered on the Areopagus, some mocked, but others said, we will hear you again about this. So Paul went out from their midst, but some men joined him and believed, among whom were also Dionysius, the Areopagite, and a woman named Damaris, and others with them. After this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. And he found a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to leave Rome. And he went to see them. And because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them and worked, for they were tent makers by trade. And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and tried to persuade Jews and Greeks. Okay. Here are the questions we uh, work together on. We always construct our questions together. I encourage you to write them down with pen and paper. And then uh, as the Bereans did in Acts 17, 11, be noble and search the scriptures daily to see whether or not these things are so. We challenge you that. I challenge myself with that because why? Because Jesus said in the closing chapter of the book of Revelation, the closing book of the entire Bible, he said, neither add to or take away from these words. Very, very strong language. Because if he said, if you add to my words, I'm paraphrasing here, if you add to my words, the plagues described in this book of Revelation are going to be added to you. And if you delete from my words, you're going to be deleted. Let's not add to or take away from the word. That's what we do here on calling on the name of the Lord. We strive to neither add to or take away. That's why all the questions and all the answers come straight from Scripture. 
We're all about revelation here and not about speculation. The truth is in the lines. It's not in between the lines as the allegorist in the teachers of origin uh, would have you uh, believe. There's no such thing as my opinion when it comes to scripture. We don't have an opinion about scripture because it's God's word. End of conversation. We either accept it or reject it. We have no right to our own private interpretation. There's no such thing, Peter says, as private interpretation. Because why? The Spirit speaks expressly. He says what he means and means what he says. God's word is all that we need. Peter says we've been given all things pertaining to life and godliness. And it's right here in the scripture. So here's question number one that we posed the other day. What caused an end to Paul's discourse on the uh, Mars Hill Areopagus? What caused an end to it was Paul spoke of the resurrection of the dead. And that broke up the crowd. That ended the discourse when he started talking about the resurrection of Christ. Uh, question number two. What two reactions came about as a result? Now, earlier we had said that two the two philosophy schools that were represented there on Mars Hill, the Areopagus, were the, the philosophical school of the Epicureans and the philosophical school of the Stoics. The Epicureans did not believe in such a thing as the soul, such a thing as God, such a thing as heaven, such a thing as hell. They believed that life was totally random and accidental, and when you died, you ceased to exist. End of story. That was the Epicureans' view. They also, uh, because of this, they said, let's eat, drink, and be merry. Let's enjoy our life while we have it, because... You only go around once in life, or so they say. The Stoics, on the other hand, uh, were people who of, of what we might call purpose. Uh, they believed in a pull yourself up by your own bootstraps philosophy. Hard work and dedication will be rewarded. And uh, that's the purpose in life. That was the Stoic view. So Paul is uh, dialoguing with these people, debating with them. Uh, yes, he was a debater, a very avid debater. That's how Paul preached the gospel. It was a debate. It was a running debate. In Ephesus, he debated with uh, the Jews and the Gentiles for two years at um, the uh, uh, debate hall of Tyrannus. So don't let anybody say that debate is not biblical. It is as biblical as it gets. So um, there's, I have a question here. We'll try to address it at the uh, end of our, uh, thanks Mary for the, uh, the question. We'll address that at the end of the, uh, the lesson. Uh, but the, the two, Results of this that, uh, first of all, some mock. These are the Epicureans. The whole idea of a resurrection from dead is, is ludicrous to them. They mocked him, made fun of him, derided him. And the Stoics said, you know, this is interesting. We, we'd like to hear more about this. Why? Were they truth seekers? No, they were. They, this, they found this very entertaining because that's what the scripture says, that they all gather every day to see or to hear or to say something new. So these are the two uh, reactions. Number three, what happened after Paul left the Areopagus? Well, a few people came to Christ. A few people were baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of their sins in order to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit and to be added to the church by the Lord himself, a few. Uh, and these are noted as being um, some men the number of which is not given. Uh, and among them were two notable persons, apparently. Uh, Dionysius, the Areopagite, and a woman named Damaris. Apparently, these were leading persons in 
Athens. And then it says, and others with them. So there's a small number, but not a large number. And uh, then we uh, move on. Uh, uh, he leaves uh, Athens and goes to Corinth. Question number four. After leaving Athens, Paul arrived where? He arrived in Corinth, which is south of Athens on the uh, Aegean or Greek peninsula. Uh, Corinth is a, a port city, very important port city in the ancient world. Uh, there was a shortcut. People didn't want to sail on the open Mediterranean Sea as they're taking goods from the eastern Mediterranean to Rome. Uh, so they would, to avoid storms, they would take this massive shortcut through the Isthmus of Corinth. Uh, if you look at the map of Greece, uh, the lower part of Greece is an island except for a small Isthmus, about an, I think, an eight mile wide stretch of land. And what they would do, they would sail from the east to the west to Corinth, which is sitting on the Isthmus, offload their goods, and then transport them to another ship on the other side of the Isthmus, and then sail across the Aegean, missing uh, the terrible uh, uh, waves and storms of the Mediterranean. So uh, Corinth was a very important place, very large place, and it had a terrible reputation. We'll talk more about that. Uh, that's why when Paul writes to the Corinthians, he's dealing with some pretty bizarre stuff because the people there were wrong. Okay, uh, who did he meet there? Question number five, he met Aquila and Priscilla. Uh, question number six, uh, how did they come to be in Corinth? They came to be in Corinth because they had been residents of Rome, but Emperor Claudius ordered all the Jews out of Rome because they were constantly fighting and bickering over Jesus Christ. So he says, enough of this. I'm throwing all of y'all out. So all the Jews were ordered to leave Rome. So that's how Aquila and Priscilla came to be in Corinth. Uh, question number seven. What did Paul have in common with these two? They were in the same line of business. Uh, they were tent makers. It's how they made a living and supported themselves. A very, very important thing in the ancient world. Everyone had to have a tent. If you traveled and all kinds of people did then as now, you had to have a tent uh, and uh, you had to have a good one. And Paul in Aquila and Priscilla formed an entrepreneurial business right there in Corinth, set up shop and made tents to support themselves financially. Uh, I just love their entrepreneurial spirit. So uh, uh, American free enterprise, don't you say? Question number eight. What did Paul do every Sabbath and where did he do it? Well, he reasoned with the Jews in the synagogue every Sabbath. In other words, he debated with them every Sabbath in the synagogue there in Corinth. Um, question number nine, the word reasoned in verse 18, verse four is best described by what other word? And we've mentioned that before, and that's the word debate. He debated with his adversaries, not argumentatively, but formally. I make a contention, you make a contention. I make an argument, you make an argument. I respond to your speech, you respond to mine, back and forth, looking for the facts of the matter. That's what debate is, and that's what Paul did. He reasoned with him. Okay, uh, today uh, we come to a new passage, and we'll go ahead and uh, uh, read that. Uh, then we'll propose new questions for tomorrow. All the questions from the scripture, and tomorrow, well, I say tomorrow will be next Tuesday. Uh, forgot what day it was. Today's Friday, so uh, next Tuesday we will uh, engage again. So uh, our passage today is Acts chapter 18, verses 5 through 11, and we'll uh, go through this passage, we'll read this passage, we'll make observations, 
we'll construct our questions together and then uh, uh, Brother Mary will answer your question that you posed here online uh, regarding what we talked about. Okay, uh, here we go. The, uh, the scripture says this. When Silas and Timothy arrived from Macedonia, Paul was occupied with the word, testifying to the Jews that the Christ was Jesus. And when they opposed and reviled him, he shook out his garments and said to them, your blood be on your own heads. I am innocent from now on. I will go to the Gentiles. He left there and went to the house of a man named Titus Justus. Uh, actually, Titius Justus, a worshiper of God. His house was next door to the synagogue. Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, believed in the Lord together with his entire household. And many of the Corinthians, hearing Paul, believed and were baptized. And the Lord said to Paul one night in a vision, Do not be afraid, but go on speaking, and do not be silent, for I am with you, and no one will attack you to harm you. For I have many in this city who are my people. And he stayed a year and six months teaching the word of God among them. Okay, so uh, Silas and Timothy had been ordered by Paul to join him. And so they joined him. Silas and Timothy arrived from Macedonia. And Paul <coughs> was already there in Corinth, and he was working the crowds. He was, as it say, occupied with the word, testifying to the Jews that uh, Christ was Jesus. This is an important thing. Paul is an apostle. Only an apostle can testify to the resurrection of Jesus Christ, because the apostles were the only ones that witnessed it. Now, Paul was not present during the ministry of Christ. He was a persecutor of Christians after the resurrection. So how did, can Paul testify to the resurrection? Well, he encountered the resurrected Christ on the road to Damascus. And in all likelihood, at Lystra, as you recall, when he was stoned to death, he tells the Galatians, that he was caught up into the third heaven and saw things he could not repeat. He has encountered the risen Christ. Therefore, being an apostle, he can testify to the fact that Jesus was the Christ and Christ was Jesus. Now, what is the significance of this? He's testifying on the resurrection to these Jews in Corinth at their synagogue and he says, this Jesus is, in fact, the Messiah, the promised one. We don't have to wait for his coming. He's already come. And he's rose from the dead. This was the message of the testifier. Now, today, can anyone testify of Jesus Christ? Absolutely not. Unless you are a 2,000-year-old apostle that somehow has remained alive. All these centuries, and we know that's just foolishness. You can't testify to Jesus today unless you're an apostle. And all the apostles died by the turn of the first or the second century. So don't let anybody say, I want to give my testimony. They got no testimony because they have not witnessed the resurrected Christ. Only apostles did. Okay? Uh, so, what kind of effect did it have on the audience in the synagogue? Well, they opposed and reviled him, made fun of him, ridiculed him. 
And what was Paul's reaction? Well, he just shook the dust off his feet, shook his garments and said, I'm out of here. Uh, this uh, message has been given and your guilt is on your own heads. From now on, I'm going to the Gentiles. And he left and he didn't go back to the synagogue again. Now, when he left there, uh, apparently uh, someone by the name of Titius Justice uh, accepted Christ, was baptized in the name of Jesus for the remission of his sins in order to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit and be added to the church by the Lord himself. Uh, so he uh, lived next door to the synagogue. He invited Paul, hey, come and stay at, at my house. Um, and then it says there was another man by the name of Crispus, and he was the ruler of the synagogue, the president of the synagogue. He ran the whole show. He believed. And uh, not only did he believe, he believed with his whole household. Uh, and when we read about belief, it means obedience. You can't believe if you don't obey. Jesus said himself, you know, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. So uh, Crispus, along with Titius Justice and all of Crispus's household, were baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of their sins. They received the gift of the Holy Spirit and were added to the church by the Lord himself. Okay, and uh, then it says that many, a large number of the Corinthians, these are Gentiles. Uh, believed and what were baptized belief and baptism are always the same you can't believe without being baptized and you can't be baptized if you don't believe they're synonymous terms they're linked together always in scripture uh, this is all very heartening or may it uh, or it may seem now you recall, Paul has recently had some, what he may have thought were setbacks. His message was, by and large, rejected in Athens. And before that, he was uh, falsely accused, falsely imprisoned, and beaten with rods. His Macedonian experience so far has been really really difficult now he's really uh working hard here but apparently there's some fear in paul holding him back because jesus himself appears to paul one night in a vision and he brings a very particular message to the current mindset of paul and paul is afraid don't ever think that paul was never afraid he was afraid the Bible says so right here. First, what's the first thing Jesus says? Do not be afraid. Now, why would Jesus say that? Because obviously Paul's afraid. And he says, don't be afraid, Paul. Uh, go on speaking. Don't be silent. Why? Because I am with you. No one. Here's what if Paul's afraid. What is Paul afraid of? He's afraid of being attacked again he's at it he's at his edge you just lord i just can't deal with this anymore no one will attack you or harm you why because i have many in this city who are my people as a result what does paul do he stayed a year and six months 18 months Paul never stayed anywhere longer than he did in Corinth, with the one exception of the two years at Ephesus. So uh, he taught the word of God among them. Paul had, of the two places, Paul had the greatest success. Uh, one was Ephesus and the other was Corinth in terms of the numbers of people who came to Christ. Okay, so uh, that's uh, the passages. Now uh, we're going to um, uh, construct our questions.
Uh, today is the fifth day of February in the year of our Lord, 2021. We're looking at Acts chapter 18, verse 5 through 11. So now we want to construct our questions, write them down on a pen and a paper, and we'll answer these on Tuesday next. If the Lord wills, if time continues, we'll be here next Tuesday. Okay, so uh, question number one, who arrived from Macedonia? Uh, question number two, what was Paul occupied with? Question number three, to what did Paul Testify. Question number four. Who and only who can testify to the risen? Christ. I'll give you a hint on that. I think in terms of a trial. Who can testify to facts one way or the other in a trial? It has to be an eyewitness, somebody who was there. Okay, number five. Question number five. How did the Jews react in the Corinthian synagogue. Question number six. How did Paul react to them? Question number seven. With whom did Paul come to stay? Question number eight. What notable person and his household came to Christ. Question number nine. What number of the Corinthians believed and were baptized. Question number 10. Who appeared to Paul at night in a vision? Question number 11. What was all afraid of. 
question number 12. How did Christ reassure Paul? Question number 13. What did Paul then do and How long did he do it? Okay, so those are our questions uh, for uh, next Tuesday. Lord willing, we'll answer those next Tuesday. Now, to uh, the question uh, before we close out, uh, Brother Mary uh, Kumar from uh, India has a question. Uh, he says, uh, Brother Russell, some people claiming that the forefathers added some of the verses in the New Testament, Mark 16, uh, 15, 16. They didn't uh, found in the ancient Greek manuscripts. Please explain on this statement. Uh, very good question, uh, Brother Mary. In uh, Mark 16, the entire chapter is the inspired word of God uh, written by Mark and preserved through the ages by the Holy Spirit. Uh, and this particular passage, uh, verses 9 through 20, uh, have been accused by false teachers that it doesn't belong in the Bible. Uh, nothing could be further from the truth. The 95%, 95% of the 5,000 plus manuscripts that have been found so far in the entire Mediterranean basin, all the way from Spain to Israel and from uh, North Africa, all the way up to uh, Austria. All of these, 95% of these 5,000 plus manuscripts include this passage. Only 5% of the manuscripts that have been found have it deleted. And those deleted manuscripts are found only in one place. They were found in the Sinai Desert uh, in a monastery. And it's interesting how they were discovered. They were discovered because uh, somebody was there. I can't remember the fellow's name. Uh, he was an archaeologist and he was looking for ancient manuscripts. And he, in uh, if you're in the archaeological business, the older uh, something is that you can find, uh, the better off it is. And he found some manuscripts that he uh, saw that were extremely old. Uh, and in fact, it turns out to be these are the oldest manuscripts of the New Testament that anyone ever found as to date. Now, there's reasons for that. We'll go into that in just a moment. However, these manuscripts were not uh, considered to be valuable by the monks that were there who were in charge of um, research of these matters. And in fact, what were they, they were doing with these? They, they found them to be so dubious and so invaluable, they were using them for scrap paper and then throwing them in the garbage can. Well, this guy comes along and he retrieves them, and he decides uh, that this is the oldest. A manuscript of the New Testament that anyone's ever found, and it likely is. Uh, uh, these manuscripts are known as the Sinaiticus and the Vaticanus manuscripts. Uh, but they were written in Alexandria, Egypt, and were written and promoted by Gnostics, false teachers. So what do Gnostics and false teachers do? They are in the business of adding to and or taking away from the scripture in order to make their dubious claims. And uh, so these are the oldest manuscripts ever found. However, they don't mean that they are original. The original uh, books of the Bible are called the autographs. Uh, they uh, have been lost forever. Why? 
because they were used so extensively for reading and for recopying. And they were distributed all over the place and they just fell apart. And uh, we understand, and we illustrated this, that if you go to a library, uh, an old book not used will last far longer than a younger book uh, that's uh, e or an even older book that's that's used. And in other words, how do you preserve a book? Don't use it. You can't preserve a book if it's continuously used. And that's one reason why the Textus Receptus is not as old, uh, quote unquote, as the uh, so-called uh, minority text. The minority text is a dubious text. It took away from the scripture, deleted passages from the scripture. And those today who promote such typically are Calvinists. Why would a Calvinist not want Mark 15, 15 and 16 in there? Well, that passage quotes Christ as commanding baptism. Repentance and baptism result in salvation from the very words of Christ. Now, if uh, you could somehow find a way to say, well, this is not scripture, and then pull it out, then uh, you would be further along on your uh, sinner's prayer type arguments. But you can't remove scripture. Oh, you can physically remove it but you can't remove it. It's scripture and it's going to continue to be scripture. The a majority text, in the received text, uh, the Textus Receptus is the best text to translate Bibles from. And that's why, uh, again, uh, uh, Mary, this is on the internet for free. Just uh, Google modern literal version. And you can pull down a PDF of the entire Bible based upon the best manuscript, the Textus Receptus, the received text, the majority text. And it includes all of Mark 16 because all of Mark 16 is Bible. And those who say it's not, well, one must question their theology. Why would they promote such a thing? And uh, you'll find that people who promote it are teaching another gospel. I hope that uh, uh, answers your question. So uh, anytime anyone has any questions, just put it in the comment section. Like us on Facebook. And uh, when we uh, end the video here, we'll include our questions on the in the comment section uh, for your uh, study and edification for when we get together again next Tuesday, Lord willing, at 10 a.m. right here on Calling on the Name of the Lord podcast. Until that time, God bless you all.